So I want to start by looking at these first two principles, keeping soil covered and maintaining living roots, because not only are they very interlinked with one another, but actually a recent meta-analysis looking at the effect of farming practices on water infiltration rates has shown that practices achieving these principles show the most promise in terms of enhancing water infiltration. Welcome to the Moses Organic Farming Podcast. This is Chuck from Moses. Continuing on our climate change series, this episode is a talk from the 2020 Moses Conference from Dr. Lauren Snyder and Dr. Jessica Gutkinecht. 2019 had double the normal rainfall in much of the Midwest, and just like this year, the need to build healthy soils that can withstand weather extremes is clear. Dr. Jessica Gutkinecht and Dr. Lauren Snyder shared research-based guidance on practices that can improve overall soil structure and water holding capacity characteristics critical to dealing with extreme precipitation events. And at the end, we hear farmers share back their reflections after a small group discussion. Lauren Snyder is a science advisor at the Organic Farming Research Foundation. She has a doctorate in ecology and evolutionary biology from Cornell University. Jessica Gutkinecht is a soil ecologist at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate. I've put the links to their slides in the show notes if they mention a picture or a graph you want to see. You won't need that since they do a really good job of describing what they're showing, but it's there for your benefit. Let's get to it. My name is Jessica Gutkinecht. I'm a soil ecologist at the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities, and uh, I also do a lot of climate change research, and so today I'm actually kind of putting that hat on and <laughs> not talking quite as much about soil, but, um, but what we're... And then... Uh, and I, I do a lot of... This work thinking about how soil is really important for for how we think about climate change in in a variety of ecosystems, especially agricultural lands. And so, so that's an introduction to myself. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to give a brief kind of primer on climate change and agriculture, and kind of pose some solutions. And then uh, Lauren's going to step in and introduce herself and talk more about solutions for a little while. So my first slide, what do you know, what do we know about climate change? Or what do you think, what do you think about? You know, we hear this in the news positively or, well, mostly negatively. So what, what comes to your mind when I say that word? Weather? Oh, yeah. <laughs> extreme weather conditions. What else? Uncertainty, yeah. So with those extremes also comes a lot more variability. We don't know when the extremes will hit. We're having a harder time predicting what's going to happen. What else? Warming, yeah, yeah. Oh, extractive economies, yeah, absolutely. We are throwing out the big words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, how are our economic, but how are our economic systems and our marketing systems playing into how some of these changes are playing out on our lands? Predicting, yeah. And so, so in my department, a huge effort is toward those predictions. How can we improve? You know predictions of what weather is going to happen next week and how do we improve predictions of and you know, where we need to go in the next 10 years, 15 years, what's going to happen. And it's getting harder and harder to do. Any, what else? Yeah, salinization. So especially in places that are getting drier, what we deal with, you know, we don't have that percolation and cleaning of the soil. Yeah, exactly. So the reason I start that way is that like, I'm going to show you some data slides, but actually, I think everyone in this room probably knows most of what there is to know, right? Um, and I, I think it's important for you to know that you already, you know, you know these things. So this is our Midwestern temperature at the moment. So from, from approximately, you know, the last 120 years, as we've been burning fossil fuels, our temperature has already gone up 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's a that's a big global. And I'll show you kind of how that teases out. You know, part of the variability is that the warming warming or or weather patterns don't happen the same way in every single place. So, especially as we go more north, we're getting warmer faster. And and actually, in my like non-agricultural research life, I, I study warming in peatlands as well. And so, so these northern latitudes that happen to store a lot of carbon um, and a lot of greenhouse gas potential are at the most northern latitudes. And so, so as we move north, 
in the Midwest, we're potentially going to see more warming. This is kind of Minnesota-based, but it applies to a lot of the Midwest as well. And the interesting thing that the way that warming is playing out, that might seem like a trivial detail, but it's not, is that, um, is that it's actually our lows. Our lows are what's going up. And so every day, you know, we have a high and a low. And it's our lows that are going up more. And, and, that's, and it's happening more in the wintertime than in the summertime. You know, in the future in Minnesota, we might just generally be getting a lot warmer all the time. But right now, it's in the winter, and it's those lows that are going up. And you could say, well, like, who cares about lows in Minnesota <laughs> in January, right? It's cold, it's cold, it's cold. But actually, those lows going up is really important. And I'll show some data on this. It's really important for, like, our, our fruit production trees and... And are like, are we killing the pests in the soil that need to be killed? Like, there are a lot of things that need to happen with those really deep colds that we used to experience in the in the cold, you know, in the deep of night in the winter time, that are happening less now. Um, and then, you know, of course, precipitation. I think this is the thing that you know most of what we're going to talk about in this session, and it's the thing that I think we're all feeling more than anything, including my basement at home. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, so in the Midwest, again, you know, there different things are happening across the country, but in the Midwest, this is just last year, you know, we're seeing these more and more and more every single year, record years, which means that, you know, if we have a record this year and a record next year, it means it's getting even wetter year after year after year. And, and especially in the Midwest, we're just seeing this, you know, increasing, it almost feels like exponentially. Um, other parts of the country like the south and the southwest are getting a lot drier. And, and this plays out in terms of our flooding. Again, I think this is something, you know, I'm just putting a picture and data to something I think that we're all really feeling. Uh, so we have, uh, so big, the big green arrows are positive trends per decade, and the big brown arrows, the bigger the arrow, the more droughts or the more negative trends of flooding. And, and again, you could see that here in the Midwest, we're seeing more and more and more of these extreme flooding events. And then I want to talk a little bit about, about where these emissions come from. Because we, like I was actually just chatting before the session of someone who's working on carbon farming. So like where, you know, who's responsible for the, this warming trends? First, you know, the, the two big, and this is global, this isn't the US. And I'll show one slide that kind of brings it back to, to our more local um, environment. So about a quarter is electricity, about a quarter is food and land use. Um, a lot of these are things that are not happening in the US. A lot of this is slash and burn meat production in the tropics. A lot of it is rice production in Southeast Asia. So, um, so a lot of these are, are not things happening here, but, but happening globally. Uh, transportation, industry, and then kind of other energy and other things. There's always a bucket of the random things that contribute, right? Um, so this is kind of the sectors that are responsible. So these are the different greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide is kind of the number one greenhouse gas that we talk about, and it's mainly because it's the most abundant one. Um, it's also the one that uh, we talk about a lot in terms of soil because the you know, soil decomposition and the respiration and activity of all these organisms is in the form of CO2. And so if we're doing practices that increase those, you know, we're, if, when we're losing carbon from our soil, when we're losing our soil health, uh, that Lauren will mostly talk about, that's coming in the form of CO2 most of the time. Uh, and this is also, you know, where our, most of our fossil fuel burning comes in. But there are other gases, um, and you can see there's some CO2 specifically from land use that's pointed out here. Uh, the nitrous oxide and the methane are also really important greenhouse gases. They're not abundant, but they hold a lot more heat. So the way that, the way that these gases work in our atmosphere is that they basically create a blanket around the Earth. And so the composition of all these gases holds heat from radiation from the sun and warms our planet. Like, that's how we all live. And different gases hold different amounts of heat. And so when we talk about some of these, you know, smaller, abundant greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide and methane, you know, they're not, they're not as abundant, but they hold a lot more heat. And so they're still really, really important to the equation. 
And then to bring this a little bit back to agriculture, the nitrous oxide, a lot of that comes from, from mineral fertilizer. So mineral nitrogen is an extremely energy intensive process. To make it, a lot of it, no matter what we do, a lot of it gets blown off as nitrous oxide or runs out as nitrate into our streams. Like that's a, just a really difficult thing to manage. Uh, as well as the methane from animal agriculture and then the tillage and like I said, losing carbon from the soil is where this kind of CO2 from agricultural lands comes from. So yeah, so I hope this gets at your question a little bit as well of how this kind of breaks down. And then if we look specifically to the US, so again, this is from, you know, this is from the EPA and the USDA that in the US, it's only about nine or 10% of all of our emissions are from agriculture. Um, so I don't, you know, if you were looking at global emissions, that might have been a different number from agriculture as well. Um, but you can imagine that there are definitely intersections and how, you know, how you slice and dice these numbers is always a question. Uh, but a lot of those emissions come from industry, electricity generation, transportation. That's kind of all the information. So how, what do you, what are your responses to this? Because I know it's a lot, it's often a lot to take in. Although I already showed you that you already knew most of this anyways. So, like how do you process this? We don't necessarily have to talk about feelings. I know it's a little, early in the morning be touchy-feely. But it's all interconnected. I think I said that like 10 times, yeah. Yeah, so a seeking of how to move the needle, how to change things. Yeah. So small. Yeah, yeah, it can feel very like overwhelming. I'll talk about feelings. I don't I have no pride. Uh, it's con yeah, it's absolutely connected to population and consumption. Yeah. What what are we eating as a population? It's hard to process like how one species can affect so many others. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm going to pull one of my later punchlines that one of the main things we can do and it, like how we consume and how we talk to our elected officials about their energy choices and what policy they're implementing is a huge thing that we can do. Like voting is a huge thing that we can do. Yeah, we no longer individuals if we're taking action together. So yeah, every time I have this conversation, it's very overwhelming and very, very saddening and pretty depressing. Like I, I'm always the depressing one, which is horrible. But, but yeah, there's so much we can also do, especially when we act together. My, my personal belief is that we still need to work on the big levers, like not burning fossil fuels. I think that's a, a, an important thing we need to keep working toward. I don't, so I don't think that's gonna be the only solution, but it, it is an important solution. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit of some of the, some of the impacts that we're seeing around the US or actually around the Midwest, excuse me. So, so how these climate changes are impacting our systems. Uh, so this is uh, corn yield loss under warming. And this, these are under, like I was, we were talking about predictions in different scenarios. And so kind of the more we warm, and this is kind of the business as usual that we often call it of, if we keep doing things the way we are, we see that especially in, as we get so, more south in the Midwest, we have these tremendous yield losses. And so that's a trend that's continuing, but you can also see that there's a lot of variance and that we can, you know, if we act, we can change a lot of that. There's also a index of sensitivity. So like for a certain amount of warming, how sensitive is that corn? And this, and this is like, there's a lot of data for kind of conventional corn. So I apologize for, you know, that this doesn't completely relate to a lot of your systems, but you know, in places like Minnesota, we actually have, you know, we're actually buffered. And I'll let you think about why, because I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. I mentioned this warming of our winter lows, and this is leading to a lot more pests. So in the future, um, this dark red color is indicating that we're gonna have a lot more years that are favorable to corn rootworm problems. And this is also for soybean aphid and some of our other pests, this is a big issue. And then of course the flooding. So we approximated even in spring of last year in Minnesota, 33 million in losses. 15 to 34 million damages specifically to corn and soy in the Midwest as well. And the more I've looked at this, the more it hard, it, like people have a hard time like pinpointing exactly the cost of these losses, but they're huge. Why do you think that Minnesota, you know, I'm partial, I live in Minnesota, but why do you think that Minnesota is in such great shape? What? Okay. 
Better soils. Ding, ding, ding. For sake of time, you are right. We have really great soil. <laughs> we have really high water holding capacity, and so it buffers us against those droughts. And we're more, we are more north, and so, but that is part of what aids in our, our great soils as well. And so soils store and filter water. So water and how a really great soil holds water and filters water. So the holding of water helps buffer against droughts. The filtering of water helps remove nitrate. So there are a lot of benefits to soils that can filter and drain water. Also, soils that filter water are a huge flood mitigation potential. I actually was in a session before this showing two fields side by side where one of them had been, you know, cover cropped for years. And right after a rainstorm, that field looked beautiful and the other field was completely ponded. So this ability of soil to process water is, is so crucial. These are some things that we can do. Um, I'm not going to touch on them too much because, but I, I didn't want to just end with all the depressing stuff. So, <laughs> so conservation tillage, zero tillage, perennialization, conservation agriculture, you know, using cover crops and mulching, all of these tools that help us build the soil and improve the soil. And also, I mentioned this, but voting. Like, a lot of those emissions are also not from agriculture, and especially in rural areas. If we're telling our elected officials that we need to stop burning fossil fuels, like, that's actually what will mitigate most of the worst damages. I wanted to make a point that we all have actions that we can take, in addition to how we farm our land. Um, but I wanted to mention, um, so one of the crops that I work on, um, I work a lot on perennialization of agricultural landscapes. I don't know, have any, has anyone, this is like big buzzword, has anyone heard of Kernza? Yeah, everyone. So, and the beautiful roots and the delicious beer. So <laughs> I won't belabor this too much, but, but when we have, like one of the best ways to put organic matter into the soil is through these deep, deep roots. And we're already seeing, even after two years, that the infiltration rates, the ability of that, of that soil to filter water is huge in these Kernza stands. Even, yeah, even, you know, in the first looks at it. So these kind of big lever, you know, really rethinking our systems um, is one potential way to go. Thanks, Jess. My name's Lauren Snyder. I'm the Education and Research Program Manager at the Organic Farming Research Foundation, OFRF. And we are a national nonprofit that's committed to fostering the improvement and widespread adoption of organic systems. So as Jess talked about a little bit with her, some of her Kernza research, we know that practices that build soil health are also really important for improving soil water dynamics. So why is that? So I'm going to go into that a little bit in my talk today and talk about some of the characteristics that are associated with healthy soils and how these characteristics can help to enhance services like water infiltration and water holding capacity. And then I'm going to present some guiding principles and practices that we can implement to increase soil health and improve water management on our farms um, and give you some real life examples of these practices actually being put into use so you can see really how powerful they can be. Um, and then I'll leave you with some ideas and thoughts about how you might want to approach thinking about, in a strategic way, how you might want to um, incorporate these practices onto your operations. So one of the most important characteristics associated with healthy soils, and that's really important to think about in terms of soil water dynamics, is the structure of the soil. So healthy soils have good tilth or in other words, good crumb structure and aggregation. And it's this open, kind of porous characteristic of healthy soils that allows it to absorb and retain moisture and make it available to plants later on. And it also makes it a lot easier for that soil to be worked. So in terms of planting your crops or even managing weeds, and more resistant to the negative effects of weather extremes as well. And so this, this good um, kind of porosity or open structure of soil comes from having a network of both small and large pores in the soil. So in this cartoon on the bottom on the right, I'm showing a soil that's a pretty compacted soil. You can see there's not a lot of white space up here in the soil. All of the um, pores are kind of closed, and you can imagine that if water were to enter this soil, it would mostly stay on the surface because there's really nowhere for it to go into the soil profile. 
But in contrast, on the left here, you can see a lot more white space. So that's channels in which the water can be filtering down deeper into the soil profile, rather than remaining on the top and running off and carrying away soil and nutrients. And this open structure of healthy soils is what also helps to foster the development of very deep and extensive root networks. And that's obviously really important for plant health, but it in turn further supports soil health because it helps to break up that soil and allow water to really infiltrate deeply into the profile so that this, these roots aren't sitting in waterlogged soils. So then the other characteristic that's really important to think about in terms of evaluating a soil's health, and that's really important for soil water dynamics, is the amount of soil organic matter that's present. And there are different components of soil organic matter, and the point really isn't in to, to go into what these different components are. Rather, the main takeaway is that these different components are at different stages of decomposition. The living, the dead, and the very dead is one way that you can think about it. And so they contribute in different ways to making both water and nutrients available to the plants, but also in terms of uh, providing structure to the soil and providing habitat for beneficial soil organisms. And so this is really important, but it's only a relatively small portion of the soil. About 1% to 6% of soil, depending on your soil type and how healthy it is, is soil organic matter. But it plays an integral role in the overall farming system's resilience to extreme weather events like floods and rainfalls, which Jess was um, just telling us are going to be more intense and frequent in the Midwest in particular. So here I'm showing you a cartoon of a healthy soil that has good soil organic matter and has a nice open structure. And you can see it's raining and the water is able to really penetrate deeply into the soil surface. It's not, the soil profile is not just standing on the surface. And there's also a nice extensive root network here, which means that later in the season, if water becomes scarce, this plant's going to be able to access subsurface moisture reserves later on and be more resilient to any type of drought you might experience. So these healthy soils really act like a sponge, and they help to absorb excess moisture from the system and trap it and hold on to it for later use. In contrast, in a more compacted soil, you're going to have more water running off from the system, and it's probably going to carry away precious topsoil and nutrients with it. We'd also expect to see a more restricted root development in these plants, which means that they're more vulnerable to drought stress later in the season. So in general, bare soils are really at risk for extreme weather events. So let's think about why, why is that? Why are bare soils so vulnerable? Well, if you think about when a raindrop hits bare soil, it's going to bring clay and silt particles into suspension at the soil surface. And as that, that water evaporates from the system, you're going to get crusting on the soil like you can see here on the right. And it's that surface crust that really makes it difficult for water to penetrate more deeply into the soil profile. It also makes these soils more at risk of erosion. So you can think about like a dramatic weather event like a hailstorm can be really serious because it can damage or destroy the current crop. But it can take Mother Nature several hundred years to replace just one inch of topsoil. So one untimely downpour or flood on bare soil can carry away tons of precious topsoil. And that's the type of event that it takes a long time for a system to recover from. So in contrast, healthy soils that are experiencing sound organic management practices are going to be more resistant to these weather extremes. And that soil life is going to be able to bounce back afterwards more easily. So hopefully I've made the point that uh, soil health is really important for mitigating these weather extremes. So how do we achieve healthy soils and how do we keep them from being bare? Well, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, has put forth four guiding soil health principles. Keeping the soil covered, maintaining living roots throughout as much of the year as possible, diversifying plants in both space and in time, and reducing the amount of disturbance that these soils are exposed to. So I'm going to spend a little time giving some examples of practices that can help to achieve these principles, and then give some real-world examples of them actually being put into practice. So I want to start by looking at these first two principles, keeping soil covered and maintaining living roots, because not only are they very interlinked with one another, 
but actually a recent meta-analysis looking at the effect of farming practices on water infiltration rates has shown that practices achieving these principles show the most promise in terms of enhancing water infiltration. And that's a key service that we need to be thinking about if we're trying to figure out how to adapt to these floods and heavy rainfalls. And keeping the soil covered is really important because it protects the surface of the soil from that crusting, which I told you makes it really hard for water to infiltrate. It also helps to build soil organic matter and it protects the soil from erosion, from wind and from rain. And then maintaining living roots contributes to overall soil organic matter and soil health, but it also creates pores and channels into the soil that helps that uh, soil act like a sponge and really absorb excess moisture that it might be receiving. So planting cover crops is one of the best ways that you can achieve both of these principles. And there are kind of three broad categories of cover crops. You have your legumes, grasses, and brassicas. And the type of cover crop that you would decide to plant is really going to largely be determined on what type of services you're trying to achieve. So if you have soils that are really depleted in nitrogen, you might want to think about planting legumes because they're excellent nitrogen fixers. But if you have the opposite problem, and you have too many nutrients left in your field from your previous crop, you might want to think about growing a grass cover crop, because in general, they tend to be really good at scavenging excess nutrients from the system. And we know that cover cropping can provide a number of benefits for soil health and for soil water dynamics in the long term, but they can also play a really important role in the short term, because in general, cover crops tend to be really good at absorbing excess moisture from the system. And so if you're planting cover crops and you have a really wet winter or a spring, it can help mop up excess water from the system and facilitate a more timely planting of your cash crop. And indeed, research from um, Iowa has shown that the long-term use of a winter rye cover crop as part of a corn soybean rotation can significantly enhance the water infiltration and water holding capacity of soils without reducing the yield of the cash crops. So there's no trade off there. And so we know that cover crops can play a really important role in terms of mitigating the negative effects of these extreme weather events. But the challenges can be trying to figure out which cover crops you want to be planting in your system, when to plant them, and when to terminate them. And I mentioned earlier that different cover crops have different characteristics and can provide different services. And I wanted to just take a moment to touch on a really neat brassica cover crop, tillage radish, because it can be really good at alleviating soil compaction. And soil compaction is something that people who are trying to transition degraded soils into organic production have to overcome. But soil compaction can also be a symptom of these extreme weather events like rain and floods, especially if you're running any type of equipment over soils when they're wet. And the reason that tillage radish is so good at alleviating compaction is because it has this really deep tap root that goes deep into the soil profile and helps to break up soil, very compacted soil. And it does this much better than most grasses or legumes, which tend to have um, a less uh, intense taproot system. And you can see it also forms a really dense canopy pretty quickly, so it can be excellent in terms of also helping to reduce weed competition as well. So returning to the principles of soil health, I want to just take a moment to talk about some of the benefits of crop diversification, both in space, so thinking about intercropping, but also across time in terms of implementing diversified crop rotations. And one way to enhance soil health and also soil water dynamics is to grow crops that have different root architectures so that they can be breaking up different areas of the soil profile. So this cartoon that was created by my colleague, uh, Dr. Mark Schoenbeck, I think does a nice job of exemplifying this idea of complementary root structures. And so you can see you have some roots that are mostly at the surface of the soil and others that extend more deeply. And so they can help to not only provide nourishment to beneficial microbial life in different parts of the soil, but also to break up the soil, soil profile. And this complementary architecture can also be really important later in the season when water is more scarce, because these plants are going to be competing less for water with one another, because they can access it from different parts of the soil. Okay, so another way to enhance diversification is across time, so following different crops with one another in a diversified rotation. And here we can again 
get some of these benefits by planting plants with different root, root architectures, but it can also help to break pest cycles, which Jess mentioned, we know we're gonna be experiencing more pest severity in the face of climate change, especially in the Midwest. And it can also provide new market opportunities as well. And then finally, I wanna just take a moment to talk about the benefits of dis uh, reducing soil disturbance. So this is a great way to build soil organic matter, but also to reduce soil erosion and compaction. And no-till practices are probably the most robust way that we can reduce disturbance in farming systems. But you don't have to get rid of all tillage to see the benefits in terms of maintaining residues on the soil surface, which are really important for holding on to that moisture in the soil, and also for reducing compaction. There is a number of conservation or reduced tillage practices that can also provide those benefits. So for example, strip tilling can leave parts of the field undisturbed, and using something like a sweep plow undercutter can leave residues at the surface, which helps to trap moisture into the soil. And research is showing us that it's really the combination of these practices, so how do we keep soil covered, how do we keep roots in the ground, in addition to these no-till or reduced tillage practices, it's really when we combine these that we see the most bang for our buck in terms of increasing water infiltration rates. So we need to think strategically about how these principles and practices can come together to really help us um, in the face of these extreme weather events. Now would be a good time to open up your phone and click the link in the show notes to the slides from Lauren Snyder. You don't have to because she does a good job describing the pictures, but it might be worth a look. So the next uh, sequence of photos comes from my colleague in California, Dr. Kabir, and I'm going to show you some bare fallow fields and fields with some type of ground cover. And we're going to see how they fare in the face of heavy rains and floods. So here is a bare fallow field that received a heavy rainfall, and you can see there's a lot of water ponding in the furrows here. And you can't see it in this photo, but there's an adjacent body of water, and a lot of this water is actually moving into that water body. So you're losing water, soil, and nutrients from the system. In contrast, right next to this field is a field that has a cover crop on it. And you can see there's virtually no water standing in that cover crop field. And I just want you to note that this is a really young cover crop that's not even fully established. But look at what a terrific job it has done of pulling that water deep into the soil profile. And I don't have the data slides here, but over the course of about a three-month rainy season, this fallow field lost about 50% of the water it received as rainfall, and this cover crop field retained 90% of it. So you can think of that as like a savings account. So that water is now trapped in the soil profile to be used by your cash crop in the growing season. Here's an example from an orchard system. Um, you can't see it because it's covered in water, but there's a bare, bare soil floor here. And then close by, um, this orchard received the same rainfall, but there's an alley planting here. Um, and again, it's quite small, but the roots from that planting really help the water to absorb, really act like a sponge and absorb the water from that system. I love this photo because it's so clear that these two fields experience the same environmental conditions. There's just a road separating them, but we have a cover crop field and a fallow field after a rain event. And if we look closer, the fallow field actually looks like a pond, but there's no standing water in the cover crop field. And so these examples come from outside of the Midwest, but they still show the potential that these soil building practices have in terms of being able to maintain favorable growing conditions, even in the face of extreme weather events. And so that's really the message I want you to walk away with. One final example, this comes from Virginia, from um, the community where my colleague Mark Schoenbeck lives. He got some great photos of a sorghum Sudan grass cover crop in the face of a flood. So this community experienced a historic flood where this river overflowed its banks, and it came onto this cover cropped field. So the cover crop got pushed down, and a fence was destroyed. But that was the extent of the damage. No soil was lost from that field. And a couple weeks later, that cover crop bounced back. You can imagine what a different scenario that would have been if that soil would have been bare. It would have been swept off into the river. 
and it would have taken the system a really long time to recover from that. So things like cover cropping can really play a huge role in protecting soil, which is one of the most valuable resources that you have as a farmer. So hopefully I've underscored the importance of these soil building practices with these examples, and I want to just take a minute to leave you with some ideas about how you might want to think through incorporating some of these practices in, in your farm or on your ranch. So the most important first step is to really understand your soil resources. Something as simple as digging a soil pit can give you a really good sense of what you're working with. What are the characteristics of your soil in terms of texture, the soil organic matter? And what steps do you need to take to improve the soil health of, on, in your system? The NRCS has a really neat web soil survey that can actually help you map out the soil units on your farm and get a better, better sense of your um, soil resources. And then from there, it's important to think about all of the practices that you're incorporating. So we know that cover cropping and crop rotations and reduced tillage can provide a suite of benefits, some of which we talked about today. But there are also potential costs and risks associated with these practices. And so it's really important to sit down and think about, OK, am I getting a lot of soil organic matter from my crop rotations or my cover crops? Or do I have a really weedy cover crop field? And maybe I need to think about what mixtures I'm growing or when I'm planting and when I'm terminating to make sure that I'm getting the services that I'm really striving for. OFRF recently published a guidebook on implementing uh, best organic soil practices to uh, increase the resilience of farm systems to extreme weather events. Um, so I invite you to take a look. You can download it for free at our website. It goes over a lot of the information I presented today and has nice worksheets to help you think through your practices and your goals. And then if you do decide that it's time to make a change and make some adjustments, make small measurable changes. Just change one practice at a time. And if possible, do it in a side-by-side -side trial with your current practices. So it's really clear to see what benefits, if any, you're getting. And try to do it on a decent piece of land, not a marginalized piece of land so that you're not starting, kind of shooting yourself in the foot to start out with. And then from there, scale up the practices that seem most promising. But really starting at a small scale is important so you're not undertaking a huge risk. And then finally, make sure that you have reliable resources that can help you think through how you want to implement these practices and what services they can provide. I'm just showing six of them up here, but OFRF has nine uh, soil health guidebooks that cover different topics from climate change to water management to uh, reducing weed competition, and they're all freely available on our website. And then here's just a list of some other resources that might be of interest to you, some national and some more specific to the Midwest. The Midwest Cover Crop Council, as an example, has a really cool cover crop tool that helps go through the characteristics of different types of cover crops and help you think about which ones might mo be most appropriate for your farming system. So we want to leverage the knowledge in this room um, and give you all an opportunity to, to talk about what soil building practices you're using now, what's working well, what's not. Maybe your neighbor has something really dialed in that you're struggling with. Um, so that's what we're hoping to achieve with the round, the round table discussions. But if you want to just kind of move the chairs and then just kind of chat among each other in smaller groups, we have some questions um, related to the topics that we were going through today. Um, but we would love for you to have the opportunity to talk about what soil health building practices you have implemented on your farm, whether successfully or not, um, and maybe hear from some other people whether they've had better success with those practices, what are those challenges. So we'll give you about 15 or 20 minutes to do that, and if you want to have someone in your group who's kind of keeping track of the conversation, we'll use the last 10 or 15 minutes for everyone to report back to us um, real quickly, maybe like a one or two minute synopsis so that we can all hear what everybody was chatting about and maybe um, come up with some solutions and ideas that you all can walk away with. Um, we're going to ask you to wrap up your conversations because we only have about 10 minutes left. So we're going to have maybe just one person from each group report back on kind of the top level takeaways from your conversations. Uh, so a bunch of produce Total. growers here. And we were just strategizing, I think, on practical ways to keep the soil covered, to build soil health at the same time. Uh, two things that really stood out 
to me was the suggestion to use city leaves, for example, and there were some concerns about breaking them down enough for people who grow lettuce and direct seed and stuff like that. So we talked about holding them and letting them compost, how to work with small equipment. That's a concern for produce growers. And also we talked about cover crops and strategies, especially if you grow something like me, which finishes late in the season, how to incorporate those, and also the use of cover crops just to fill row space and keep the ground covered while your main crop is growing. Really good suggestions, I thought. Awesome, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll go to people back there. So uh, our group had a lively discussion on when to tile, when not to tile. Uh, we had <laughs> we had quite a uh, array of soil types and uh, discussion on anaerobic soils versus healthy soils topography, all these sorts of things that you might take into consideration for whether or not you need to tile or when it's best to do a mechanical sort of correction. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also kind of talked about, can we as organic growers finally ditch the moldboard plow and still get decent weed control in our road crops? Mm. So we kicked around some theories there. The sandy soil representative. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> we figured out how to make money on uh, low organic matter, dry land, sandy soil. <laughs> Too bad you guys weren't in this group. So the kind of uh, weather related obviously is uh, the amount of moisture in the soil and we talked about um, even planting cover crops and stuff uh, to get the moisture to even break that stuff down as a challenge. Um, soil building, um, I talked a lot about this, you know, um, using animal manures uh, around me. We have a lot of chicken barns, using that to build the soil. Um, instead of cover cropping for cash flow reasons. And um, I talked a lot about hay, al deep-rooted alfalfa with some sod forming brome grass and then renovating with corn every six, seven years. Um, I don't really grow cover crops. I count hay as a cover crop. Um, conservation tillage, um, I till pretty uh, heavily every five to seven years and then go back to no-till. Okay. Maybe up here. We had a great group. Um, we talked about uh, multi-species multi cover cropping, but integrating plants and animals in the system that uh, is mutually beneficial, just really mimicking Mother Nature. Um, we also talked a whole lot more about what we don't usually do as farmers, and that's that we need to be advocates as, as farmers and ambassadors, get out and educate everybody we can. I said, you know, if there's 3,200 people here, if we all talk to 100 people and they talk to 100 people, imagine what that what that can do, we can, we can choose two options. We can wallow in our, um, all the difficulties or we can really look at all of the great things that we can do. Um, I look at you know, the, the feeling question that you asked earlier, it's, that makes me excited. We're the right people at the right time at the you know, right point in history. We know the answer, all the answers are in this room. We just have to go do it and we have to teach the people that need to make the decisions with their dollars every day and what food they buy to actually make the right decision. So I'm half of the equation. Thank you so much for that. And we talk about that a lot in like climate change communication as well. Like the more we talk about these things, the more we can all move. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just basically one of the things we talked about was one of the ways to make this happen, to get this information out, to educate the consumer and to help educate the farmers as well in a way that is respectful and moves things forward. And we have a couple ideas for that. Last group. I guess we just talked mainly about ways we could change tillage practices. We talked about some cover crops. We talked about increasing soil organic matter. I guess that was one big thing we, we mentioned. We just talked about tillage. Even if you do continue doing tillage, your method of tillage can be important as well. One thing we've incorporated in our farm is, like you mentioned, the undercutters where it, it doesn't disturb the, the soil as much. We, when uh, we started this, we took the, the twists off our chisel plow and put sweeps on it, and that has made a big difference. Thanks to Dr. Jessica Gutkinect and Dr. Lauren Snyder for their workshop at the 2020 Moses Conference. Stay tuned next week for the final episode of our series on climate change. 
We've got a lot of field days coming up, so be sure to check out that link in the show notes. And we've also been putting together videos from those field days, so visit our YouTube page to check that out. And thank you for listening to the Moses Organic Farming Podcast. Leave us a voice memo of a memorable farm smell, and don't forget to subscribe and tell a farmer friend about the show. Moses educates farmers in sustainable and organic agriculture. One of our programs for beginning farmers is an event called New Farmer U. It will be held on October 29th and 30th, 2021 in Willow River, Minnesota, along with our partners Renewing the Countryside. It is a two-day event with a focus on farm financial and business management, geared toward farmers with three to six years of farming experience, or farmers with less experience who are ready to plan for the future of their farms. Check out mosesorganic.org slash newfarmeru for more information. If you have any questions about today's episode or have ideas for future episodes, please contact me at chuck at mosesorganic.org. Our theme song is Summerfields by the Tenements. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>